Attention, the following broadcast has been approved by Outcasted OC. Viewer discretion is advised. Incoming transmission in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We're getting spooky on NXT because it's me doing the review today. Um, no, it's just Halloween Havoc, so let's get into it. We open Halloween Havoc Night 1 with a live performance of New Year's Day playing their new song, Vampire. This was really cool to see, especially because there is history with New Year's Day being the original band that made Rhea Ripley's first theme of Brutality that was played in NXT quite a lot. So I thought this was awesome. We get Shotzi and Scarlett hosting all of Halloween Havoc for both the nights as well. Um, they get to talk a little bit about a little bit about their series they've been doing on YouTube as well where they go and explore haunted locations with other famous wrestlers. I thought that was pretty unique to discuss and their costumes were amazing. We had Hellraiser Pinhead out of Shotzi. We had some vampire themes through with Scarlet and then the most notable one that I would say was the Shining Twins that they both did uh, which goes into a segment with Carmelo which we will get into. But yeah, we start off very strong with going uh, Roxanne Perez versus Kiana James. Roxanne Perez was wearing a very Freddy Krueger inspired uh, commentary, made a really cool one, um, like one liner of saying one, two, Roxanne Perez is coming for you. And I thought that was really awesome. Um, match went completely off because this is known as a Devil's Playground match where it's basically all rules go. They had like a play swing set they had bin, uh, bins everywhere multiple different things went on in this match and it was a very hard hitting fast match really cool stuff with Perez being the way that she usually is doing a lot of her high flying moves and Kiana James trying to approach that differently and doing a more aggressive style and attack to it we also then see um, very interesting approaches to different weapons so unique ways of how the bin was getting involved we saw uh, spots where Kiana was diving out the way from Roxanne trying to hit it there was also a time where the swing was used to just hit Kiana in the face Kiana then also got a laptop that was in her business bag that she carries with her involved smacked the laptop off Roxanne uh, one of the most interesting notes of the match which was kind of like it took me out of the enjoyment of it for a moment was the ref grabbing the bin and pulling it back in place so Kiana can catch Roxanne with a hurricane run out off the barricades on, on the side of the ring which looked awesome at the time to then powerbomb into this bin but it would just look like the ref was like oh no they've ruined the spot let me quickly move it hopefully no one notices and the camera definitely caught that on the hard cam and didn't make it look that great um really awesome spots though towards the end where we get to see off the top barricade um Roxanne once again just jumps down count tries to do pop rocks gets countered by Kiana but takes the opportunity to hit uh Kiana with her own bag we find out there was a brick inside of that bag once the bag was hit on Kiana Roxanne hit a finisher of Pop Rocks and just sprinkled the debris of the broken brick that was inside of the bag over the top of that and Roxanne got the win. Fun, enjoyable match, very good way to open it. There was a really interesting Russian leg sweep into the slide as well to kind of really hype up the crowd in that moment. So all in all, great match that I thought. We then go into an interview with Carmela Hayes where once again he's being questioned if he in fact was the one that jumped Trick Williams because of him being the fourth member in this match and Trick Williams was taken out of it so he couldn't be involved to be in that fatal four way which was a shame it then became a triple threat and Carmelo was the one that won that triple threat so a lot of people are questioning Melo's intentions and what it was Melo keeps getting annoyed by this and stating he wouldn't do that to his best friend and he said justice for Melo so he's really playing into the fact of he didn't do this, this wasn't on him. You should ask a few other people. Uh, we then have the Lexus uh, King debut match. This match was interesting enough. Um, we kind of see the talent he's already shown, kind of what he did within AEW, but this whole kind of style saying, like, Brian Pillman's dead, he's trying to carve his own way. 
appearance alone i thought was really awesome because the entrance he has are just that kind of thrown that heavy metal music coming in and gave him kind of very much like a biker um like rock appearance and i thought that was really cool especially how the throne slide slided in with him having the name like king it does give that atmosphere um match all in all was good he was a hard hitting where he needed to be but the problem i had was the finish to it didn't really come across like a finishing move it was kind of like randy orton's style hang you out on the rope by your feet ddt but then also hit to crossroads which would look cool as a signature but it didn't really feel like a finish and i think a lot of the fans felt that way too because it kind of felt flat when he hit it like there wasn't a massive pop for it or anything and even booker t was like oh what's he call it what's he call it so i don't think that is his finisher yet um because they're still working on it and potentially haven't gave it a name yet but we will see where that goes we get a little throwaway bits now of where scarlet uh, is reading tarot cards which i thought was an awesome call to the fact of scarlet's actual character with carrion they always pull out tarot cards to pick their next victims and things like that and we're reading it to noah dar and his team and speaking about how they're going to lose the championship that he holds dear which is the heritage cup to to tozawa sneakingly stole it when they were distracted and i just thought this was a hilarious bit tozawa's now posing with the heritage cup and saying you know where you can get this and he has now gone to a haunted house for it so noah dar and his group are now going to have to explore a haunted house to get the heritage cup back so i think that's going to be fine and quite a fun style we then have a women's breakout tournament match this was one of the semi-final matches going into it we see uh kalani jordan correct me if i'm wrong in the comments of how i'm pronouncing some of these names but we see Kalani Jordan wearing a Spider Gwen inspired gear. I thought this was incredible. The look of it and just the presentation of the style she was wrestling as, as well, really fitted this gear uh, approach, especially because she has this gymnast high flying style. So it worked perfectly for her, and the match was all around really good. Um, I think her ring partner being this kind of pageant queen miss nxt sash wearing character in ariana grace was awesome as well it was a very we've seen these type of characters before but not presented in that type of way and she really did play this i'm a beauty uh kind of heel like oh don't hit my face i could see very much her teaming up with like a chelsea green or a tiffany stratton later on in the future if she's given more opportunities after this tournament because she really did shine in playing her character up especially in the ring as a heel um once again match was very back and forth but Kal uh, kalani really showed her high flying style with these amazing drop kicks and the finisher being a split leg moonsault that she landed for the one two three really spoke volumes of how quick and athletic she was in that ring um cool note to add on the side of that we quickly saw everyone was watching this match and a lot of people are in different costumes we saw an ugly buggy we saw someone dressing up looking like tiffany stratton which comes into a match that is going to be happening uh nxt night two and we then also see axiom dressed as an akatsuki member from naruto i thought that was just really cool to see at least some people can't like costuming with anime and especially axiom i really like axiom so that was awesome to see uh we then get scarlet and shotzi again uh shotzi is dressed up as an edward scissorhands like um inspired costume this time that shotzi changed her costumes a lot more than scarlet did um but yeah i once again i thought it was really cool to see what they were going with and it turns out they were going with the creed brothers coming out saying they lost their opportunity because angel and alberto um lost them an opportunity to go against the tag they stated they'll let the wheel decide it and what it turns into is a tables ladders and scare match for night two of halloween havoc i thought this was really cool to add that kind of extra tension and still have the fun and charm of halloween havoc especially these type of speculation matches can go really 
interesting and it depends what they're going to do as the scare options because I always enjoy seeing those. We now have Andre Chase and Duke Hudson versus The Family being Stax and Tony D'Angelo. The match opens with Chase and Stax having kind of like this arm drag over fight so one arm dragged her one then the other responded with the exact same we see um, a headlock quickly get put in and then we see a sneak tag uh, from Duke but it doesn't really matter because Stax takes flight knocks them both out clean and the match goes very much back and forth in uh, Duke Hudson and Stax for the majority of it we didn't really see much of Tony D'Angelo I don't know why that was but they didn't really add him enough into the match in my opinion they made him very much the hot tag guy and it was cool to see like Duke coming out and really showing why he's now being called the MVP he did a lot of clutch moments in these matches um, just as a note he like broke the bada bing bada boom that Tony D'Angelo and Stax were going to do he also um, did an incredible German suplex on Tony as Stax was literally about to get the free count on Andre Chase and the constant back and forth was amazing to see um, the part that finished this match which I thought was really interesting is JC Jane is saying to Andre Chase look take this pipe while the ref's distracted hit with the pipe and Andre's like no we're going to do it fairly Tony D'Angelo goes to do one of these running use the momentum of the ropes to do his big lariat doesn't realise but he knocks JC Jane down and as JC Jane is knocked down Tony is kind of shocked and was like oh no I didn't actually mean to hit her and Andre Chase takes perfect opportunity to do this and gets the one, two, three count. So Chase U is now Chase Champions. And it is awesome to see. I love Chase U. I love where this story progression is going. JC Jane trying to make them be more heel like, but they're not. But also Andre Chase just kind of used an opportunity of one of his kind of team members to distract someone. So we'll see where that storyline progresses. Are they going to turn heel? Are they not? Are they going to be legitimate champions and have quite a few defences? Or are they going to lose the championships very quick in a rematch? We will see. Uh, Nathan Fraser gives this kind of like hard troops like news bulletin story where he just kind of rips into Dominic and says about the Judgment Day always having his back and how Rhea is basically just always babysitting him and he hates him and it's going to turn into a fight because Halloween Havoc last year was one of his worst ever years but next year it, this is going to be one of his best ones and we will see that happen when he goes for the North American Championship uh, Halloween Havoc Night 2 pretty cool, short and simple was interesting we got a lights out match between Gigi Dolins and Blair Davenport these two both really showed the Halloween Havoc essence to it they were both in Halloween gear Gigi Dolins picking Beetlejuice and Blair Davenport wearing the yellow raincoat from it even walking out with a red balloon and having Blair Davenport on the pockets was a nice little extra bit to it um, gear is one of the things I really enjoy getting to talk about and Halloween Havoc really brings that kind of out of people testing new things and making things cool with pop culture and horror and it, it just makes me happy to see all of it um, the match was very back and forth of just who can do more damage with whatever ever weapon we can find um, they had straight away let's go get a chair there was brutal knee shots uh, Gigi Darlings hitting a meteora on the outside with a chair the match kind of got ruined by the fact a commercial break happened so early into their like fight and the issue with that being with these type of matches where it's like let's grab all these weapons let's go grab these tables it really took away um, you know oh they've now set these up but where's the other wrestler and things like that and there were things in the ring where you were like if you weren't paying attention because of the commercial breaks you wouldn't have noticed them there uh, but there was an awesome spot to finish this match I think it the right winner did win this in a very interesting way the uh, commentary desk announcement area uh, got cleared like it always does so everyone thinks oh it's going to be a commentary desk spot. Someone's going to get thrown on it. Well, in fact, there was a table in front of it. And Blair looked at Gigi to be like, oh, I'll do some damage on here. Hit her on here. And then maybe I'll do something with the table. Gigi goes to reverse this. Blair kind of scouts it out, realises it. 
and hits a falcon arrow straight through the table drags gg body in for a one two three count i thought that was an awesome way to finish it blair kind of needs this momentum gg is already really hot with the fans right now and as a baby face her losing it just gives her more momentum to be like yes i'm the underdog yes i have been losing a lot lately but i will get my revenge in some of the best ways possible and i'm, I'm here for this i'm ready to see what goes next in this kind of storyline feud but once again awesome hard hitting matches this is very much a weapons focused <coughs> pay-per-view-esque episode and i'm here for it i really enjoyed everything they gave us uh Ilya has an interview about how he is still the champion he's been the champion for about a month now and how he is going to deal with a lot of the competition going forward he spoke about how he recently traveled home and got to sit with his son and his son held the belt for the first time and his son just showed pure excitement and joy and that was a driving motivation for Ilya and Ilya spoke about his past how he started from nothing and he knows he can go through all this pain as long as there is a reasoning behind it and he's now stated his game isn't going to change his attack isn't going to change now that he's champion if not it's going to be elevated more he's going to be more vicious because he knows how hard he has to go to keep this belt because of how much it hurt him to have the belt to begin with i thought that was incredible we then go into arguably my favorite spot of the night even though it was like nothing crazy it's just it's one of my favorite horror movies of all time and seeing two of my most preferred female wrestlers getting the spotlight of doing this hosting and getting to show their horror enthusiasm shots in scarlet dressing up as the iconic twin sisters from the shining to mess with mellow's head and be like oh all points like you know all signs are pointing to you you were the one that attacked trick and he mellow just didn't want it he was like yo if you want to mess with someone go mess with someone else i'm not here for it like i need to focus and it's how they do the iconic head tilt as well to try and get it out of mellow it was just it was just gold uh, i love every bit of that segment we then get the second breakout women's tournament match in the second semi-final between Carmen uh, Petrovic versus Lola Vice. Petrovic was very good in the style of kind of hard hitting kicks and this kind of more martial artist style but had a little bit of gymnast like athletics to it whereas Lola Vice came across more as this like grounded fighter you try and come at me I'm going to hit you hard. Um, the match was significantly shorter than the prior um, match in this kind of way it was short and sweet very hard hitting Lola Vice got the win on this in what I would kind of point as like a black mask esque finishing kick where it's like that spinning roundhouse that just knocks someone out um, she hit it straight from the ground caught uh, Petrovic very quickly in that style and I love seeing it to get the 1-2-3 count so we now have Kal uh, Kalani versus Lola Vice for the finals of the NXT Women's Breakout Tournament. We then go into, as I was mentioning, Tiffany Stratton being interviewed how she was the finalist of last year's and we have the whole backstage argument that turns into now Tiffany Stratton has a match going into Halloween Havoc Night 2, which will be interesting to see. Um, this is kind of a unique story going for Tiffany, especially after she has lost the belt recently. But I kind of already want Tiffany back in the main title picture and already going back to try and reclaim the belt. It feels weird her having such a short reign, having such a big poster match against Becky to then she's kind of now gone further back down the storylines and not the main focus. But we will see what goes on there. We get Chelsea Green and Piper Niven backstage for some reason. It was awesome to see Chelsea Green and Piper Niven finally coming to definitely some agreements in like costume because Chelsea Green was Red Riding Hood and Piper Niven being the big bad wolf I thought was awesome and a good little joke there talking to JC Jane and Fear. JC Jane and Fear going back and forth with 
um, Chelsea Green and Piper and now they're like cool we'll take you to Sean Michael's office and we will you know make it even better you guys don't go here let's actually challenge you for the belts if you want to talk big to us so that's what they've gone and done and it is now an official match for Halloween Havoc Night 2 we now have kind of the last interview like backstage interactions of the night of Bron Breaker and Carmelo Hayes having a conversation I loved this because it re-established Bron Breaker as not just this weird I've been the main event guy for way too long so I'm now just kind of be forgotten he stated once I finish this business with Von Wagner and Dr. Sto like Dr. Stone I'm going to get rid of you simple as and then once I've put him in the hospital and you win against Ilya if you bring the same mellow that drum jump trick Williams it goes straight back to me and you and I love their feud I think their feud for the top spot has been one of the most interesting parts of NXT for a while so it will be great to see that kind of continue and hopefully they really do emph emphasize that feud going once again if it does happen but I can't see Ilya losing it this quickly straight back to Melo. I feel like Ilya is going to hold this belt for a long time until he decides he is ready to either move up or the company decides he is ready to move up. I see him as a perfect can candidate to either go against Walter or potentially join the Imperium line and be kind of another driving force for the mid-card belts on the main roster now. But... I'm happy as an NXT champion. I feel he fits that role very well. And he's arguably one of the stronger guys that have been there for a longer time. We now have Jay Cargill sit down to look at the main event. I'm not too sure why they keep inserting Jay Cargill here and there. It's like, I know you're trying to emphasize the story. As she's looking at all, all her options. And she's trying to see what would be the best place for her to start. But it's becoming more and more just tedi te tedious is the word I'm looking for there it's coming across more tedious because you, you're you coming across like you're just waving it in front of her like oh look at this shiny new toy we've got yet you're not letting it progress a story or have any involvement you've not let it out in the ring yet and you've not picked a brand or made her decide what storyline because one minute you had her kind of feuding with Charlotte, next you've had her feuding with Becky, and it's now Rhea and her potentially as well. So it's like, let us know where it's going because it is getting very much the same, and I'm not here for that. But then we go to Becky and Lyra um, having this main event. They have an iconic stare down. This is history in the making for a lot of fans because these are two homegrown talents that worked together and trained together for the longest time. Becky was one of the first people to go and hug her as soon as she was in the performance center and was always back in Lyra's corner so it's awesome to see these guys show anything you could do I can do the same if not better and that was pretty much this whole match. If Becky did a shoulder bump Lyra did the same. If Becky did a leg drop, Lyra did the same. If Becky went for submission holds, Lyra was doing the exact same. And that was pretty much the whole of this match of who can out strike, who can out submission move, who can out do this. There was many two full counts. One of the really awesome parts was Lyra doing this mid row drop kick straight into Becky, but Becky then realized let's pull Lyra out when it, she got herself back up threw her towards the ring post, Lyra realised this and quickly turned so her back hit more of it than her shoulder. Um, we also get a really unique spot where a superplex happened and Becky doing the leg drop straight after a suplex, well no, it was um, looked like it went to go for a leg drop so she reversed it to do a super, superplex to then do a DDT and Lyra still kicked out of the DDT. We then have um, kind of the man slam that was happening the, the, throughout the match like trying to attempt to do it Lyra counting, uh, like countering this Becky did an incredible move of what was like she walked the ropes while holding Lyra and rolled over like a front flip and did like a stunner at the same time I don't know what to refer to that move but it looked absolutely incredible and I want to see that more 
Laura did a uh, sit down power bomb on Becky as well, and it's not so Laura bring that out for a bit of time, so that was really awesome to see. Um, but we did get Laura countering the man slam and getting a very fast three count to win this bout off Becky. Becky in pure shock, same as Laura, not even realizing that happened, and Becky did snatch the belt off the ref, but out of respect to actually ha physically hand it to Lyra and give Lyra a hug and give her her praise. What we don't get the camera properly show, but you do see it in a couple of glimpses, is Becky stares up towards Jay Cargill with a bit of frustration. So does that mean this is where the rivalry starts now? Or is this just to play on us more of who's Jade's first major opponent going to be? We will all see, but I'm super happy for Lyra. I think that was a great call to make. Uh, Lyra definitely needed this high-level push against such an amazing talent like Becky Lynch. And I feel like that won't be the end of the story. I feel Lyra will follow the same traits as Becky Lynch and let anyone just challenge for this belt. And Lyra will step up and show out for these matches. But let me know what you guys thought of Halloween Havoc. Let me know what your favourite part was. If you don't already, like the video, subscribe, and follow all the socials down at the bottom. And I will see you guys on the next review.